All right, so um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the last uh, coaching seminar for this semester. Uh, it's great pleasure for me to, to introduce Charlotte Arduin, and she'll speak about kernel methods and differential Galois theory for combinatorics and probabilities. So um, hello, everybody. I would like to thank the organizer of the coaching seminar for this invitation. And uh, my talk will be about some uh, recent application of differential Galois theory to uh, problems coming out of enumerative combinatorics and uh, probabilities. So uh, this will be quite an informal talk. So my aim will be to make you understand how um, starting from um, a function, a special function that comes out of combinatorics and probabilities to satisfy the weird functional equation one can, by specializing this weird functional equation over an algebraic curve, obtain a dynamical one, and in fact, a linear discrete uh, order one equation. And uh, this is to this linear discrete order one equation that we will apply differential Galois theory in order to obtain some uh, algebraic characterization of the special function that was solution of the initial equation. So uh, these applications, they uh, combine uh, algebraic geometric aspects, uh, different sugar was theory, but also they are connected to some nice arithmetic question that I hope I will have the time to explain. Okay, so um, let me, ah, okay. So I cannot move my slide. Um, Maybe I, you need to make it full screen. Yeah, I am in full screen, but usually I use the arrow of my laptop, but this is not okay. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay, I will do like this. So uh, my first um, example will be the walks in the quarter plane. And uh, what is a walk in the quarter plane is just a sequence of points with uh, integer, uh, integer coordinates uh, that starts uh, from uh, the point zero, zero and ends somewhere in the uh, first quadrant of my plane. And all that time it remains in the quadrant. And to go from one point to the next one, one is forced to use a precise set of directions. And uh, the sets might vary if you choose another uh, type of walk. So for instance, in my figure, I uh, use a set of direction, uh, northwest, northeast, southeast, and south. And these directions they are encoded by pairs of integers between minus one and one. The pair zero, zero, in fact, corresponds to the fact that you stay at the same place. And then you will assign the probability to each direction, the probability to go in that direction. And you will ask, what is the probability for a walk to go from 0, 0 to the point LS, the end point, in k steps? OK, so let me be more precise. OK, so a weighted model for a walk, it's just a set of nine rational numbers, is DIG, who uh, belongs to the, the, uh, zero, the uh, interval 0, 1, and whose sum is equal to 1. Uh, the set of direction of this weighted model is just a set of non-zero weights. A non-weighted model, it's a model whose weight at zero, zero is equal to zero, and such that all the other weights are equal. And then up to a rescaling, then you can assume that the weights are equal to one and forget this condition that their sum is equal to one. The situation of unweighted model corresponds to the initial enumerative situation. And uh, in fact, it's really the counting problem. You want to count the walks that start from zero, zero and go to the point LS in case steps. In this counting problem, we will, of course, uh, attach a generating series. So we fix a set of weights, W, and we consider the following three variate series. So you see here, X and Y are connected to the coordinates of the endpoints. 
whereas the variable t here is connected to the length of the uh, walk. So it's a three variable series, but I just denote its dependence in two variables, x and y. In fact, t will be considered more or less as a parameter. And in my talk, I will be mainly interested in the dependence of the generating series with respect to the variable x and y. So now the coefficients, these probabilities, they are uh, the cardinal of the walks from zero, the number of walks from zero, zero to LS with k steps using this precise set of direction and weights divided by the cardinality of the set of direction to the power k. So since these quantities, these coefficients are smaller than one, the generating series converges on this following set. So um, one is interested in knowing all the coefficients, but it's a very difficult uh, problem. And so you will try to have information on the generating series to get partial information on its coefficients. And uh, to begin, oops, you uh, can show by a step-by-step -step induction that the generating series satisfies the following equation. So I use colors uh, to, um, to emphasize the properties of some of the, its elements. So this red polynomial, that red K, it's a trivariate polynomial, which is biquadratic in X and Y. It multiplies the generating series you are interested in. And on the other side of the equation, all the black terms, they are just polynomial in X and Y. And you see the violet terms, they are the specialization of the full generating series, uh, sending one of the variable to zero. So these violet terms, they depend, in fact, um, only one of the variable. So they are easier uh, series. So the violet one are called the sectional generating series. And you can find, in fact, analogous equation in other situation. So for instance, uh, for generating series for stationary distribution for random walks. So this times you consider random walks really the probabilistic situation that are confined in the first quadrant. And in fact, this was the first situation and many ideas in my talk were initiated by uh, Fayol, Jasnorowski and Malisha. Once again, in this equation satisfied by the generating series P, F, X, Y, you find your uh, generating series in blue multiplied by a biquadratic polynomial. So here you have no T because in fact, you are not counting the lengths of these random walks. The terms in black, they are polynomial in X and Y and the violet terms, they are function of only one variable. They are also unknown but they depend only on one variable. Recently, uh, we proved that a similar equation holds also for uh, the Laplace transform of stationary distribution for semi-Martingale Brownian motion confined in a curve. I will not define this uh, probabilistic uh, notion. So uh, it has been introduced by Harrison, for instance, and um, just rough idea of what it is, you, when you're considering um, a stochastic process, it's satisfied in a certain sense, a stochastic differential equation. And when you take Laplace transform of a differential equation, then you find something more algebraic, which is written below. So the Laplace transform in blue is multiplied once again by a biquadratic polynomial. And on the other side of your equation, the gamma one and gamma two in black, they are polynomial. The phi one of X and phi two of Y, they are more or less characterize the um, behavior of your uh, um, stochastic process on uh, the walls of your cone. And they are also unknown, but they just depend on one variable each. So I just uh, give, show you the picture of um, of uh, this semi-Martingale Brownian motion confined in a cone. So here you have 
uh, your cone with wedge beta, and you have some vectors of reflection on the uh, frontiers of your cone, and this mutilda is what is called the drift uh, of the Brownian motion. So you see all this equation, they have the same form, which is as follow. So you have an unknown function f in blue, depending on two variables. You have a biquadratic polynomial k. On the other side of your equation, you have simple function, which are polynomials, this b, a1, and a2. And you have also two unknown functions in violet, but both depending on only one of the variables. So the polynomial in red is called the kernel polynomial. And in fact, the idea beyond the kernel method is to specialize this equation on the zero locus of k. So that the complicated instances of your unknown function, this f in blue, will vanishes. And on the other side, you will only have f1 and f2, which are much more simpler to study. So you will study first the violet function, but since you are the full functional equation, knowing f1 and f2 will allow you to retrieve f. OK, so what is the classification problems for this special function? So um, of course, we would hope to express this generating series or this Laplace transform as a combination of special function. But sometimes it's too difficult. So we will try to find a hierarchy of proper property that will characterize our function. So for instance, we will ask, if this function is algebraic over the field of rational function. And if it is, we could expect to use uh, computer guessing to find the algebraic equation and thereby the function itself. As a second step, if the function is transcendental, then we could hope that it satisfies a linear differential equation over the field of rational function in two variables. And with respect to each of the derivation, this is called definite. And in fact, if you're starting with a generating series, that is a formal power series, this definiteness will give you some, um, some linear recurrences on the coefficients. So that you will have information on the asymptotic properties. And even you might hope to solve completely uh, these linear uh, recurrences. If the function is not definite, then one could expect that it is dealgebraic, that is, it satisfies an algebraic differential equation over the field of rational function. And finally, uh, well, uh, you can try to prove that your function is differentially transcendental, and but I think um, then you are leaving the realm of humanity. <laughs> okay, so. Um, how do we get a dynamical equation out of this weird functional equation? So as I said before, we will try to uh, specialize it on the zero locus of this uh, polynomial, this kernel polynomial. So we will consider the kernel curve, which is defined as the compactification of the zero locus of this biquadratic polynomial in P1 times p1. And we will assume that it's an irreducible curve. So if it's not an irreducible curve, then it means that your polynomial factorizes in a certain sense, and uh, that you have a relation uh, between, um, for instance, um, y and uh, x squared. I don't know. So uh, you can specialize on this smaller relation and show then that uh, uh, unknown function is algebraic. So it's an easy case. Assuming that the curve is irreducible, then one has a dichotomy. Either it's a genius zero curve or it's a genius one. Moreover, since the curve is, is in P1 times P1, you have two projection. Just sending here a point on its x coordinate and here another one on the y coordinates. And the fact that the curve projects on this 2p1 gives you two involution. 
Yota 1, the first one, will fix the x coordinates, and Yota 2 will fix the y coordinates. So we will use this involution to find a dynamical equation starting from our real functional equation. Okay, so the composition of these two involution is no longer, well, perhaps no longer a finite order automorphism. And it happens that it is a Q difference operator if the curve is of genus zero, and it's a translation by a point P of the curve if it's of genus one. Okay, now let's try to find a dynamical equation. So I will evaluate uh, the equation on the kernel curve so that the left-hand side vanishes. So let me rewrite my equation as follow. I divide by a1, and then I find that this and this, there are elements in the function field of my curve, and I will briefly denote them by g and h. So now I can use my first involution on the equation one, and I find a new equation. But you see in this new equation, since yota one of x is equal to x, you find the same f1. Then you can just subtract these two equations in order to eliminate f1. And noting that f2 of y is fixed by yota 2 because yota 2 is the other involution that fixes y, you find the following equation, which involves only f2 and it's transformed by tau. So you see, this gives you an order one linear discrete equation in tau, which is an inhomogeneous. Here you have an inhomogeneous uh, term. So finally, you end up by studying an order one non-homogeneous discrete equation in tau. So you can play the same game with F1 and you will find another equation. So I cheated a lot by doing this uh, small trick, but it's essentially the idea. So why have I cheated? Because this uh, solution F tilde uh, is an analytic continuation of the first, um, the first function we were starting with. So it's kind of really technical to show that your generating series that is defined on a quite small open set can be analytically continued in a compatible way with the action of the involution and the automorphism. So this is a technical part. But at the end of the day, when you have done this work, you have a solution of an order one equation. Moreover, the coefficient of this equation satisfies some strong uh, some strong condition with respect to uh, the involution. So for instance, here the coefficient a uh, satisfy yota one of a is equal to one over a. It's just the norm of a with respect to Galois extension generated by yota one is equal to one. And here you have also a condition of, on p. And the fact that these two coefficients satisfy such strong constraints with respect to the involution will also give strong constraints when you will study as uh, a differential Galois theory of uh, the discrete equation. So uh, now, since we are interested in the differential algebraic property of the solution of this equation, we can use, in fact, parametrized Galois theory for linear difference equation to study the differential algebraic properties of the solution F tilde over the base field, with, which is C of E, the function field of your curve, tau is the automorphism, and delta is a derivation who commutes with tau. So in the genus zero case, in fact, C of E is just C of Z, and tau is just a Q difference operator, and delta is the D over DZ. When you are in genus one, in fact, you can do a multiplicative uniformization of your kernel curve as follow. 
And then you can embed your, fun your field of elliptic function in the field of meromorphic function of a C star. And then a translation by a point of the curve will correspond also to a Q difference operator. So then you just take the same derivation. Okay, so I will not give a lot of detail on this parameterized Galois theory, but I will just um, explain uh, what kind of uh, results we can have in a special situation. So I will go back to uh, my example of uh, walks in, uh, in the quadrant. And I will assume that my curve is genus one and that, that I am studying such an equation where tau is the translation by a point of the curve. And I really like this situation because it mixed a lot of nice arithmetic. Okay, so let us go back to the initial situation. So the kernel curve here is contained in P1 times P1, but in fact, it's a general fiber of a family of elliptic curve. Uh, ET that depends on this parameter T. In fact, my kernel curve was chosen for a transcendental value of T and you have here a whole family of curve. Some are singular of a P1. So you have an elliptic vibration in fact. And the two involution, they correspond to the translation and uh, whose composition is, sorry, uh, to the projection. And two, it's just a translation by a point P of E. And in this talk, I will assume that P is non-torsion. If P is torsion, then you can show that the generating series is a zeta function, more or less a zeta function of a nisogenous elliptic curve. And then you can show that it's defined. This translation by P, it's also something that moves in family. So once again, you have your uh, curve, elliptic curve uh, E, and you have your family depending T. And you can do so that P, it's just the intersection uh, of a rational section of your uh, elliptic vibration, which I will denote by P. So uh, this translation by P on my spatial fiber propagates on the whole family. Okay, and finally, let me recall you that the generating series they can be analytically continued into a meromorphic function F tilde over C star that satisfies such an equation, to of F tilde minus F tilde. So E as a coefficient in is one for uh, walks in the quadrant and uh, equal b, where b is an elliptic function satisfying delta one of b equals minus b. And if you want really to be precise, b is this element of the function field of the curve. You can write it uh, algebraically. Okay, so now what is the first result? So um, I will first consider unweighted models means that all the weights on the direction are equal to one. Then you can classify these models. This has been done by Mihres Mbus, Kemelu, and Mar Nimishna in 2010. They classify, in fact, all the walks in the quadrants, and they study the algebraic case, and also some non-definite case. And uh, I try to quote many people that work in that area, and I hope that I haven't forgot anyone. So my picture uh, figures of 51 models that are associated with a genus one walk and whose automorphism tau is of infinite order. So the first big steps to tackle this model had been done by Irina Kurkova and Kirlian Hachel in 2012. They uh, used the first time the functional equation to show that the generating series was not definite. And they, uh, their proof relies on the following fact. They found a, sing, uh, a pole of the generating series and they use a functional equation to propagate these poles and to find an infinite number of singular points for the generating series. 
so that this generating series cannot be defined. The next steps uh, was a result by uh, Julien, uh, Thomas and Michael and myself in 2018. And we proved that the 42 blue cases were differentially transcendental and the nine red cases were differentially algebraic. And these nine red cases, they were first uh, uh, found by uh, Olivier Bernardi, Mireille Buscemino and Kilian Rachel. And they even exhibit an explicit differential equation for these nine cases. So of course, this situation is quite puzzling because you would like to know what I, why are these nine cases peculiar? And also, uh, could we uh, extend this strategy to weighted model? Okay, so I will try to explain this in the, how many time I have? So you have about five more minutes uh, and then we can take a break and we can Okay, continue. so I will try to explain <laughs> a little bit. Okay, so for instance with Michael, we worked more and we proved, we gave example for a weighted example. And for instance, this model, if you put weights on each direction, we can show that it's di differentially algebraic if and only if the following condition is fulfilled by the weights. You can remark that if all this quantity, this dig are equal to one, this quantity is automatically zero. So in fact, the nine cases, there are nothing peculiar except the fact that they fulfill this algebraic condition. So let me try to explain how one can find this condition. Okay, so the first step of the study of um, the use of parameters Galois theory to this uh, order one equation was the following. This is what we used in uh, with Julien, Thomas, and Michael. We proved that the following statements are equivalent. The generating series is differentially algebraic. If and only if you can find a linear differential equation in B with constant co coefficients, such that this quantity is equal to tau of g minus g. More or less, we say that it says that the parametric Galois group of this equation, which is a differential algebraic subgroup of GA, the additive group, will not be equal to GA if and only if it is given by a linear differential equation. It relies on this classification result. So you might think that uh, trying to show that this last equation is satisfied is difficult. Uh, it's not easy, but we found a criteria relying on the orbits of the poles of B and with respect to tau and some residue computation. So we were able to apply this criteria to the unweighted model. But for weighted works, it seems a little bit difficult to uh, use this criteria. So working a little bit further, uh, with Michael, we proved the following. So the generating series differentially algebraic, if and only if, in fact, you can find such kind of relation, but with n equals zero. You do not have to derive b, which is much nicer. And this is essentially due to the fact that yota one of b is equal to minus b. So this is strong symmetry of b that allows to lower uh, the order of the differential equation. Moreover, we proved that this last condition is equivalent to the fact that two precise poles of b are in the same orbit with respect to the action of tau. And this condition is much nicer to test. Uh, and I will uh, try to, to explain why it's easy to test. It's quite easy to test. So remember my curve is in fact a curve defined over Q of T and it doesn't descend to Q. It's, it's a non-trivial, it's a non-isotrivial vibration. And then you have what is called a height. So the neuron height. It's, um, it's a map from the uh, Q of T point of E to Q. 
which has the following property. The height of a point is zero if and only if this point is torsion. If two points are connected by a linear relation, uh, then the height here of m is equal to n square height of n. And for the special point we were considering, the height is computable. And it's computable up to a finite number of possibilities. And here, the fact that it's computable relies on the theory of model V lattices uh, for rational elliptic surface that I have no time to explain, <laughs> of course. And, but this is really this fact that will allow us to, uh, in fact, test um, the, our orbit condition. So let me tell you how, how this works. So we want to test if M is equal to test with the N N. So an elliptic curve, it's, it's an abelian group. You can choose to select your, the zero of your curve as you wish. So let us assume that the zero of my curve is n. Then I have tau of n is equal n plus p, and it's equal to p. Okay. So tau to the n of n is equal to n p. Therefore, if m is equal to tau to the n n, this is equivalent to m equal n p. Thus, computing the height of m. We know that m is equal to tau to the n n if and only if the height of m is equal to n square height of tau of n, that is n square the height of p. So we compute the height of m and the height of p up to a finite amount of possibilities. And this will determine the finite amount, the finite potential n such that m is equal to tau to the n n. And since we have a finite amount of integer, then we just compute tau to the n, n, and we compare it to m. And this comparison between m and tau to the n, n gives you the algebraic condition on the weights. So this is a complete algorithm. So uh, I want, uh, sorry, very fast. So I was wanted to give a panorama and in fact, there are many perspectives to this work. So for instance, people are interested in walks, three-dimensional walks that stay in a Norton. And for that, that work, you will replace the kernel curve by a kernel surface, which is in fact given by a tri-quadratic polynomial with three involution. So this uh, surface has, are called velar surface and they are also very nice since they are K3 surfaces. So you can try to play the same game but the situation is in fact a little bit more delicate because you have a lot of section, in fact, because you have this, this, this guy. So you have many ways of going out of your art. Another situation, which is also very puzzling uh, with respect to algebraic geometry is when you consider walks, walks with large steps, instead of doing a step of, of length one, you do a bigger step like this. And in that situation, the kernel curve is no longer given by a biquadratic polynomial. So you have no longer this two involution. So you need to figure what you can do to replace, to find new ID to replace this involution by other automorphism. And finally, uh, so there are also many probabilistic situations where you could expect to have uh, also higher order equation coming out of uh, this weird functional equation. So I will stop there. <laughs> thank you for your attention. Thank you. So let us thank um, Charlotte. Uh, do we have any question at this point? Well, let me maybe ask a short the general question. So once you have uh, the full classification, who is the, the algebraic, the transcendental and so on, is it possible now look combinatorially and say that, well, typically if you have like southeast step, you are you are hopeless, or it, typically if you have I don't know two steps in opposite directions, it's bad. So uh, going back from algebra to combinatorics, can you can you say something about what are these uh, good and bad sets of steps? At least on like okay, I, I'm not sure. level. 
Uh, I'm not sure that I completely understood the question. Um, in, in fact, uh, so what, what we proved with Michael that is that this differential, uh, this classification uh, does not only depend on the direction, but depends on, on, the, on the weights. So when you put weight one, the classification is complete. Ah, okay. It's complete. So it's, it's all, yeah, yeah. I, I was I, I was asking about weight one actually. Yeah. So so I was asking about station when it's complete. It's, it's uh, complete. Everything yes. is ex well. Uh, so you have differential it runs on total function, but uh, so I, I don't know what you can expect about this function. But in in the other cases, in the differential algebraic cases, uh, you know the differential equation, and um, so it's it's really complete. Perhaps the only uh, remaining no no it's complete even in uh, in because you might wonder if this uh, generating series are differentially algebraic in the t variable, but it's it's also almost done. For unweighted the model, it's everything is is done. Uh, maybe I can say something to this question. For instance, there are some small things known. If all the steps lie in a half plane, for instance, so that's some combinatorial fact. Yeah. And we, we know, you know, something about the uh, generating series. It says something. Ah, okay. It says okay. Something. So there are some small things like this. And a case, there, I think, are some facts concerning symmetries. If, mm -hmm. uh, if, if, but in general, no. There's, uh, I haven't seen a really good interpretation that if you know, you have w w walks that contain a, a step in the eastern direction, then it's always this. There's yeah, that, that's, that's what was, I was kind of wondering, but because in, 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 in the proof that uh, Charlotte sh has shown, the steps were encoded into the kernel and the combinatorics was not uh, like, it was kind of implicit, right? So I was wondering whether one can go back, but uh, it's, if, if it's really not obvious, in fact. So, uh, okay. uh, so you, you have some kind of combinatorics when you are computing the heights, it depends on the mm -hmm. position of some points. Um, but well, the combinatorial, purely combinatorial uh, explanation on the weight and on the direction, I, I think it's, it's not easy. Oh, I, I tried great. to find something by, well, I was dreaming about toric varieties and the explanation ah. coming from that realm, but uh, it's, it's, well, it's really not uh, obviously connected to. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I, I understand better now, thank you very much. That's the, I mean, but that's good since uh, algebra is unavoidable. It's I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> okay, so I think we have a question from Jason, and then we'll take a break. Go ahead, Jason. Oh hi, hi, nice talk. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to ask. It's maybe hard to formulate this question, but if you think of your steps as being letters in an alphabet, uh, then the walks that stay in a certain region corresponds to a certain language. And I'm wondering if there's some way of quantifying the complexity of the generating functions and comparing it to the complexity of the language. For example, if you have something like chomsky schutzenberger theorem that says uh, context-free, you know, unambiguous context-free languages are, have algebraic generating series. Maybe you have that this language is context-free when the generating series is algebraic or yeah, I had no, I have no idea, but I found this interpretation really nice. So I, I well, I'm, I don't, I don't know, and I don't even know if people had thought about this before. So uh, perhaps, but uh, do you know, Michael, this kind of? No, I'm curious how you would uh, um, incorporate the fact that you can't leave the quadrant into rules for the language. Um. Well, I mean, I oh, in terms of proving it's like context sensitive or something like yeah. this. Uh, yeah, that's the question, right? I mean, some certainly some of these will be regular languages, I guess, right? If you just again, I mean, uh, well, I mean, if if you can never hit the boundary, yes, yeah. but <laughs> but in general, it seems like, well, I guess that's the problem. How, how, like how maybe maybe that? in the algebraic cases, maybe that it somehow is some 
somehow context free or something. Maybe there's some push down automaton that that recognizes the language. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you need to figure out a pattern uh, to avoid. Yeah. No, it's an interesting, very interesting question. Well, the question was um, when the step sets has a repeated entry, what does it mean? Uh, what do you mean by a repeated entry? So yeah, the weight, so, the weight yeah. is twice as much of uh, some other thing? Well, the, no, it's a double arrow. Could that be what it means? I mean, yeah, that, that would be a sensible interpretation, I guess. Although, in other words, if all the steps are weight one, and then when you repeat it, it actually means one of the steps is weight two. Is that what it means? I mean, you could say it's twice as likely to choose that step right, right, as to right. choose so that's some weight. other so that's step. The weight. And that would be the way. That's yeah, but I'm not sure it's it's that because when it's weighted, they put a number on the arrow, and and I I've seen some, I think. So so the context of the was posted in the in the chat, so you can see that you you mentioned it as uh, I mean you as Michael as a co-author of that paper um, says this open problem number four to find a human uh, proof of that result. I, I don't see it in the chat. I think it was posted. I think you need to resend it. Perhaps it's uh, when we are in the breakout rooms, it, it just disappears. Uh, okay. No, but, no, but, but I um, think the chat was. So if you send it them. in the breakout rooms, you'll send it, I, I think, only to. But it's to everyone. Does that mean, yeah. oh, okay, I'll, I could send it again. Right. Uh, Again. I think um, William's uh, comment is in the chat, so it's open yeah. problem four. So this is this is this is the paper that uh, has that entry. Um, it was an op the open problem. I didn't cut the, I didn't have, the, is to find a human proof, I mean, for that computational result. But my question is that uh, you said, note the double minus one zero step. So I want to understand what does that mean? Uh, it, it could mean what Michael said, of course. And it, it would make a difference, of course. Yeah, I mean, if you assign different probabilities, So Jason was thinking about the coloring of the arrow. I, I, I really, I, I don't know. I've seen this, uh, this kind of pictures of models with double arrow. But yeah, I, I, don't I can't know what remember. The double arrow means, but I, you know, I, 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 I know what the, these D sub I J can be thought of, and those are probabilities. Right, right. Well, so there's one way to know. So there are six, six uh, steps there. Two of them are the same, so it would mean that it's a one-third probability to get to a minus one zero. That could be what it means. I don't know, but uh, yeah. what yeah. I'm asking. All right, thanks. Let's go on. So uh, I think Jason yeah. just posted a comment. Yeah, so I, think, so he's, right. I think he's saying what we've been saying, but right. you just... Uh, no, yeah. okay. All right, so I think uh, Carlos <laughs> has a question. Again, I can't hear it. Hello, Carlos. Yes, I did. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, uh, my my question was, uh, well, I had a few very small questions, but uh, the last one towards the end, uh, you started looking at um, at the uh, at the family of of um, elliptic curves in that case parameterized by 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 t, and you mentioned that um, the 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 point that defines the automorphism by adding adding p to everything that you could choose that uh, also across the family to be some kind of rational section. Um, I'm wondering in the you know in the in the few points where where the elliptic curve degenerates, 
um, does the point corresponding to that uh, um, uh, bad fiber still have a meaning? Like maybe in that case, the, the elliptic curve descends to just being like some, some kind of P1 and then the point in the rational section is like a Q automorphism now. Uh, is that what happens or is it just uh, weird and you well, take it out? Um... Well, no, not really, but <laughs> this is precisely where well, uh, the, the intersection of this section with the singular fiber that allows to compute the height. This is precisely, uh, well, uh, the, all, all the information is contained in this, this intersection of the section with the singular fiber. And uh, some of these singular fibers are classified by Codera classification. They can be much more uh, complicated than just a P1. They can be cycle of P1s or uh, even a worse thing. So uh, this is where... Uh, um, well, when you blow them uh, up, they become this. Uh, well, our computation comes. Yeah. And in fact, well, I uh, just recently thought of this question and I found... Uh, in fact, also interesting to um, to think of that you you have a, a difference equation um, which is parameterized by t, and you could wonder if you can uh, retrieve the information uh, of the Fugawa group from its specialization at, uh, um, for instance, the at the fiber where the the translation is torsion. It will be a little bit in the spirit of the Grothendieck conjecture. So uh, I wonder if it's, it's true, for instance, or if it's uh, enough information. Because I, I think that if you're taking a non-torsion section, then uh, at, you can, well, I think you have an infinite uh, set of value that's, so that it's specialized to a torsion point, or perhaps I'm, I'm mistaken. But I, I was, um, I think it opened some perhaps nice question. So in the differential case, you can have uh, an infinite number of specializations where the group becomes finite. And it's, it, it's not an, well, of course, it's not an algebraic condition. It's very much a, an arithmetic condition. So, yeah. I mean, no, I was just uh, thinking of the usual Galois group, not the parameterized uh, one. No, no, I'm, well, I'm talking about you have a parameterized system of uh, differential equations. Ah, yeah, yeah. Then okay. for certain values of the parameter, I mean, e even in the genus zero case, certain value of the parameter, the, um, the group becomes finite, but generically for a generic value, whatever that means, the group is infinite. It, it's a uh, result by Hushovsky, it's kind of- Hilda's Well, I mean, y prime equals uh, t divided by x times y. Yeah, 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 but I, I, I thought that Khrushchevsky proved some kind of results in this spirit, no? He said, he showed that um, you can, you can specialize outside of a small set. Mm. And yeah. yeah, that's true. Gener you know, the, the ex he, mm. he somehow gave a, a sense for the exceptional set. But my, my question was more, uh, you know, uh, well, in terms of, is it, is there some analogs of the curvature criteria? In, in the difference way? case? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think William has another question. Uh, uh, Carlos, first, Carlos, um, I think uh, you said you have many questions uh, before I move on to. Okay, so I'll move on to William's question. So uh, William says- Yes, but I, I'm, I'm uh, about to get in the car, so I'm going to be the first second. It's, it's, uh, it, it, we're having trouble that enough, that, that's That's fine, Carlos. So. <laughs> okay, so let me move to William's question. So. So he says, in the classification of the 75, 79 cases, five cases have D transcendental GF. And he's asking, do we know what the GFs are? Uh, 
I mean, they might as well be gamma functions, and, yeah. but we don't know. So yeah, I, I think, guess the yeah, question think... is, could you, could you solve them in terms of well-known detranscendental functions? Well, I was trying to see if there are other different transcendental functions other than gamma function. So I, I think they, are, they have integral expressions mm -hmm. because, well, uh, for instance, the method of Kilian Rachel and Irina Kurkova, it's using boundary value problem. So they use integral representation, but so it's, it's not easy to, uh, to, to see what it can gives you as, as function. Um, so you have integral representation of this this generating function but it's not special function you you really understand if i remember well perhaps correct me now. do we do we know if there is any real if there are any relationship among these generating functions that are d transcendental uh, among them i mean among them right so it's a good question it, it's not easy to uh yeah it's not easy to know so for genus zero, you could try to compare. Well, if but if it's genus zero and genus one, it's difficult to put things together. But it's it's a it's a good question. So every one of them has the um, in in the uh, in the step has the uh, what minus one minus one. Is that right? No, has the has the um, all right has the northwest and southeast direction there. Every one of them. Um, is there any um, reason for that? Or I mean, there are other, of course, there are other things, but. Uh, again, if, if all the steps are in a half plane, things are very degenerate. OK. So, so you, you so this is the to, whole plane, I suppose. You, you have to not be constrained to a half plane okay. at the very least. Uh -huh. And uh, when you say half plane, you mean divided by the axis or maybe no, by no. diagonal? By there, there's some line and it yeah, lies on just the one side of the line. Okay, I see. So, this, so these are the examples where they are limited to the half plane, right? Those are the easy ones. Right. Yeah. They are very degenerate ones, I should say. Okay. All right, so do we have any, uh, what, Carlos, go ahead. Yes, I hope I hope this works. Thank you for your patience with my uh, crazy plans this morning. Um, I was wondering when, when when Charlotte listed the possibilities for the for the generating series in terms of um, um, algebraicity or differential, uh, you know, definiteness or so on. Um, I know that uh, one could ask similar questions about, about T uh and uh, these questions come up often and i still have them but but also just talking about differential algebraicity or definiteness with respect to uh, uh x and y um in in principle there seems like there, there could be a few other possibilities for example for the generating series to be definite with respect to x but only the algebraic with respect to y or all the other uh, kind of mixed situations. Can that not happen because of some some reason? No, I, well, um, uh, it's it's entirely symmetric for X and Y. So uh, if it has a certain behavior with respect to X, it's the same behavior with respect to Y. It's completely symmetric. It's it's really because of the way you obtain your uh, your equation. In fact, so uh, that's why I just show you one part of the the function so sectional but it's it's entirely symmetric if one is differentially algebraic the other will be if it's defined at the other will be also i see thank you and then if i may just a quick follow-up question um in the uh in the classification of what what kind of algebraic curve might be defined by the kernel there's a genus zero on the genus one case in the genus one you have the shift by a point on a LP curve. In the genus zero case, there's a there's a situation that, in principle, might happen that doesn't seem to. You said that you always get um, a Q difference equation. Uh, why is it never a shift? Is it because it comes about from composing two involutions or something? Uh, it's the nature of the singular points. 
In fact, when the curve is of genus zero, it's, uh, you have a, um, only one singular point, uh, which is double. And, and then you, you find, in fact, when you, uh, sorry, you blow up and you find your genus, uh, your, your P1, you have your two, uh, two fixed points for your uh, automorphism. So it's necessarily a Q difference operator. You cannot have Thank a parabolic you. thing. Okay, so any any of our questions for Charlotte? So I think if we don't, then we've run out of time. Uh, and so let us thank Charlotte again for the very great talk. And also I wanted to thank you for, for and the other organizers of this uh, Colchin seminar. It's been great, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you, uh, thank you all. Yeah.